as before, we should have a term called as khalaf, and something we call khalafi. And this is usually a term, uh, uh, this is a term which is used, oh, excuse me, khalaf. This is a term which is used not in the linguistical sense over here, meaning that if you're after a salaf, okay, therefore we're al khalaf, but this is a term of uh, offensive. It's a term, a disparaging term, used to mean people who have uh, come later on and they have deviated from the belief of the salaf. Although the Eshari, uh which is a deviated group in belief, they say that the knowledge, they say the people of the khalaf were more knowledgeable and more wise than the people of the Salaf. All the people of the Salaf were sound better off because they didn't speak about these topics that these Ashayas have invented or innovated. So the point is Salaf is usually used as a discouraging term. So don't consider yourself saying that I am from the Khalaf and something like that because I'm not from the first three generations. You know, you shouldn't describe yourself that way. You can use the term essential. Okay. Okay, so now we have want to mention two hadiths very quickly. And these two hadiths form a foundation for our understanding of the Messenger of Jumeirah. And there are many hadiths on this subject. And I invite you to look at uh, volume one of um, Mishkat al-Makabiyah and also volume three of Kitab al-Sunnah, uh, Kitab al-Sunnah Abu Dawud, Kitab al-Sunnah, you'll find some of these hadiths. But the first hadith, of course, in the hadith which is in Bukhari with the Prophet said, I'll just mention it in brief, that there has remained a single group upon the truth. Okay? A single group upon the truth. And the second hadith is the hadith which says the Ummah was divided in 73 sects, and they're all going to hell, so they will go to hell, and only one will be saved. And the third group is, in one narration, he says, those who are upon what he is upon today and his companions. Okay? So those are two hadith in brief, and I think they're very well known hadith. This is in Abu Dawood and Asura, and this is in Bukhari and so far, I said there will always remain a single group upon the truth. And then in that one night, he said they will be manifest, they will be victorious. Upon those who go against them and upon those who quit or abandon them. And they will remain such until the day of judgment in one night, until the Messiah descends the second time, eighth and Maryam. And another night, he says, until Allah decrees his matter, meaning that the close of the day of judgment. The second group is that, uh, second hadith, Prophet said that this nation would divide like previous nations divided. And in one nation, as the Jews divided into 71 sects, 70 of which went into hell, and only one was saved, and the Christians 72 groups, 71 went to hell, and only one was saved, and he said that this Ummah would divide into 73 groups, all of which would end towards hell, except for one, and the Prophet Prophet's companions being very, um, interested in knowing which was the way of salvation, they said that the third group was that which he asked who are they and the messenger side some reply that they are those who are upon what he is upon today and his companions. So the point over here is the Prophet mentioned his companions provides the foundation or the proof that he said earlier that number the Jana'a means that those people who refer back to the understanding of the Salaf al and so forth. The Prophet didn't just say they are just following what he is upon. He said, and my companions were up hobby. So that the companions are the yardstick to understanding which the Prophet came with. Now let's think about this just from reason uh, prior to the proof of the Quran and Sunnah. We know the Prophet came with a message, with a revelation, right? And Allah in the Quran has described it says, Well you alumuhum al kitaba will fikma. That he teaches them the book, the scripture and the wisdom, the wisdom being the Sunnah as the Salah has mentioned. Who was he teaching this to? Obviously his companions, right? Among his family, like his, the Prophet's wives and his relatives and also those people who believed with him in Mecca and Muhajirun and the people of Medina al-Ansar and even those people in Arabia who became Muslims later on 
and heard from the Prophet and teaching. These were his companions, all of them. Mm. And these are those who he taught to the book and the wisdom. Their understanding is the Arctic. Now that we are so many centuries uh, separated from the Prophet Sallallahu revelation, there is no way for us to understand how the Prophet Sallallahu what the meaning of that revelation is unless we refer back to their understanding. And that is in itself a, a great lecture. You know, it's, maybe we can take a whole week of lectures if we're why we should do that. But that's just the foundation. We're just trying to introduce ourselves. Who is this single group that is upon the truth? And who is that uh, that faith that the Prophet ﷺ described? So let's see what the scholars of Islam have said. Abdullah ibn Mubarak said that they are, in my view, Ibn Mubarak, he died in the year 181. 181. So he's part of that earlier generation. Yeah, he said that. Is that right? Have you ever said that? Third generation. 81 or 181? He said, it is in my view that they are of Abu hadith the people of hadith, the adherents of hadith. Also we find that Ali ibn al-Madini, one of Imam Ahmed's companions, great scholar of uh, hadith and rijal, narrator of hadith, says they are the people of hadith, they are of al hadith. Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, if this victorious group is not Ahmed hadith, then I have no idea who they are. Ahmed ibn Sinan, who is also another scholar, who died in 259, but after Ahmed, says they are the scholars, they are Ashab al-Athar, or Athar. Athar and Athar, uh, I read in English, I'm not really sure what he said, he used the plural word, part of the uh, symbol, because both are translated or really in the same way. Uh, it means hadith in this sense, it means that which they inherited in the Prophet Sallallahu And Bukhari said it means Ashab al-Hadith, that they are Ashab al-Hadith. And you'll find in Sahih al-Bukhari, he mentioned in volume 9, in Kitab al-Itifan, uh, the Kitab al-Sunnah, he says they are the scholars in the translation. But in his other book, Khalq uh, Af'an al-Ibad, Khalq Af'an al-Ibad, he says that they are Ashab al-Hadith or Ahl al-Hadith. So it shows that they understood, the scholars throughout the centuries, they understood that they themselves, that that school, Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah, Ahl al-Hadith, As-Salaf al-Salih, they understood that they were the ones who were intended by these narrations of Prophet And that's why the Salaf used to say, as um, mm-hmm. Therefore we find that Qatada, who was one of uh, the scholars from Al-Basra, from the Tabi'in, he says, uh, it is from the good fortune Sa'ada. Now, Sa'ada, good fortune over here, good luck, doesn't mean in the sense of a, a worldly sense, but in a religious sense that Allah Sa'ada has guided this person that which is good. That Allah allows for the young man who wants to become religious, or for the person who doesn't speak Arabic, al ajmi that he allows him to come across or meet a person, a scholar, from the people of Hadith. And that's because they realized that for those people who wanted to, whether they were young people and they wanted to become religious, or they were people who didn't speak Arabic, and then therefore they were removed from the source of the Prophet and Sunnah, that the key for their salvation was to meet a man from the people of Hadith. And that is why Qatada said, perhaps it's Qatada or somebody else in Qatada, and said that my maternal uncles, or my paternal uncles, well, some of his relatives, were Shia, and some of his other uh, relatives were Qadiriya, which is another deviant set. And Allah guided me to a certain person, a certain scholar of hadith in his time, a certain scholar of Salaf. And Mujahid bin Jabr, that great scholar of Tafsir, that scholar of Tafsir who Al-Bukhari, uh, who al Thori, excuse me, Thori, who was a scholar from the third generation, said that if Tafsir comes to you by way, explanation of Quran comes to you by way of Mujahid, Pay heed to it, pay attention to it. Because it is known that Mujahid was one of the students of Ibn Abbas. And Ibn Abbas, the Prophet's companion, was that person who the Prophet made dua for him. He said, Oh Allah, فقفه في الدين وعلمه التأويل. Give him understanding in the religion and teach him ta'weel. Ta'weel in the sense means explanation of the Quran or the meaning of the Quran. Mujahid was one of Ibn Abbas's students and he said that I 
presented the Mus'haf, the Qur'an, the scripture to Ibn Abbas three times, from one cover to another cover, or from its beginning to its end, stopping him at each verse, saying, asking him, what does this verse mean concerning who was it revealed and when was it revealed? So Mujahid had all this great knowledge of tafsir, and that's why you find that the earliest scholars of Islam based the tafsir upon the tafsir of Mujahid very often. Imam al-Bukhari, for instance, in his Sahih, when he explains the verses in um, chapter titles, it's not usually translated in the English, but in the Arabic, usually when he's explaining different verses, certain words, he's usually relying upon the tafsir of Mujahid. And likewise, Imam al-Shafi also would do likewise, rely upon the tafsir of Mujahid. What did Mujahid say? which I had this great thought from the second generation, he said, it doesn't matter to me which of these two blessings is greater, the blessing of Islam or the blessing of the Sunnah. And why did he say that? Well, because we know that the only religion which is a man may attain salvation through is what? The religion of Islam. And the only group among the 73 groups within the fold of Islam which a man may attain salvation through is what? The people of the Sunnah. And that's why Mujahid said to me, it makes no difference. Which of these two blessings is greater? That Allah guided me to Islam, or that Allah guided me to the Sunnah? Because he realized that, what is he trying to say? That, you know, you need both guidances. You need a guidance to Islam, that you don't follow one of the six other five false religions. Because as Ibn Abbas said, and this will probably close up the lecture, Ibn Abbas said that the religions are six. Five belong to Satan, and one belonged to Ar-Rahman. And he took this from the verse in Surah Al-Hajj, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that verily those who believe, that's the true religion. And then he said the Christians, the Jews, the Sabians, the Medjus, or the Magians, and those who commit shirk, those are the five religions which belong to Satan. Inna Allah yafsilu baynahum yawm al-qiyamati fi ma kanu fihi yaktarifun That Allah will judge between them on the day of judgment in that which they differ. So the Abbas said the religions are six, five belong to Satan and one belongs to Rahman. And I like in that one religion which belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, religion of Islam, and concerning the Prophet's Ummah, we know there'll be seventy three groups and only one will be the saved group. Those who adhere to what the Prophet was upon and his companions. And that is why uh Mujahid said it makes no difference to me which of the two blessings is greater, that Allah guided me to Islam or that Allah guided me to Islam. So, the importance, that was just a brief introduction just to put some terms, you know, uh, down. I didn't mean to take up all the time in trying to explain these terms, but unfortunately that seems what has happened. So, and I'll leave um, some time now to further have some questions concerning what we went over. And I know you might have some questions concerning some other topics, but hopefully, inshallah, they will be expressed uh, uh, throughout the lectures. Wallahu alam. To kind of answer that. Yeah, uh, 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 he was a great scholar from the Sahara, and he said that it is from the Sa'ada, which means the good fortune, in this sense meaning that Allah has guided that person, has blessed that person, that for the young man, when he wants to become religious, usually youth, from some youth, you know, usually two of the things happen, either they get lost in their passions, and some youth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, that they realize that it's important to become religious. So he wants to become religious now. Which religion shall he follow? And likewise for the non-Arab, because in, especially in the time of the Tabi'in, you might imagine that the non arabs were those people who were entering into the fold of Islam. Because early on in this, uh, the history of Islam, I mean, the majority of the Muslims were Arabs, and the people who entered into Islam were usually non arabs you know, at that time. That if they wanted to come into Islam, if they were to sit with the Shia, or they were to sit with the Khawarij, or they were to sit with the Qadariya, they would be going astray. What would be the benefit for them to have become Muslims? Obviously, it's better for them to become Muslims than to remain Christians or Jews or fire worshippers or cow worshippers, but the point is is that for them to attain full salvation would need them to adhere to this prophet of Sunnah. So, Qasada said it is from the good fortune for the young man who wants to become religion or for that man, the non-Arab, meaning those who introduce the full Sunnah, that Allah guides him that he comes across a man of the Sunnah. And you can see this very clearly here in the United States. 
Those people who become new Muslims, they come into the masjid, and their hearts are filled with love of Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu If they bump into good brothers, alhamdulillah, usually their matters stay straight. If they bump into Sufis or uh, other, you know, Qadianis or Shia or...